Shabbat Shalom. I hope that everybody will continue eating, but quietly, as we continue with the program for this evening. So it's my honor to invite up Dina Ellen Vogan and Roger Kamenitz to come and sit on the red chairs in the front so that you, so that you can see them. And while they're doing that, please may I ask as a service to our wonderful caterers who have given us the meal tonight, that people volunteer a person at their table to bus plates so that we can get the plates moving over to the other side of the room. Thank you. I can see that at the front, people are listening to, and at the back as well. Yes. Thank you so much. And our caterers, thank you too. Thank you, everybody. So the title that we chose for this evening is Rekindling Words of Light. Rekindling Words of Light. And the reason for that, as a number of the clergy have been saying for a little while, is that it's hard to walk away from the light of Hanukkah. It's hard to turn our back on the fully lit Hanukkah and find our way again in the darkness. But it's always been the case for our people that words bring light, that words are our candles. And so it's beautiful and appropriate that we make a space tonight for poetry and I invite us to think of it as candles that are lighting our way away from Hanukkah and giving us the reassurance and the knowledge that we're not alone and that it's still possible to find light. So let me introduce our guests and then they're each going to read from their books and then there'll be time for a short Q&A at the end. So please be formulating your questions for them as you listen to their words and their wisdom. So tonight we welcome Dina Ellen Vogan. She's author of Apples of the Earth and Shore, which she'll be reading from tonight. And also a memoir, Drawn from Water, an American poet, an Ethiopian family, an Israeli story. And Dina has received fellowships from the Illinois Arts Council and the Ragdale Foundation. Her work has appeared in anthologies and magazines, including 101 Jewish Poems of the Third Millennium, City of the Big Shoulders, I'm intrigued by that, Beyond Lament, Lit Hub, Bellevue Literary Review, Brevity, Prairie Schooner, December, and many other venues. <laughs> Dina holds an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and she teaches creative writing at the University of Chicago Writers' Studio. Roger Kamenetz is the author of 15 books of poetry and prose, among them The Jew in the Lotus, the History of Last Night's Dream, The Lowercase Jew, and his latest is called The Missing Jew, and that's what he'll be reading from tonight. He founded the MFA in Jewish Studies minor 
at Louisiana State University, shout out to New Orleans, where he retired as Sternberg Honors Chair. So please welcome Dina and Roger. Thank you, Rabbi, for the wonderful introduction. And thank you all for being here. And thank you, Ikar, for inviting us. Thank you to Bernard Friedman for making this all possible. Yay. Thank you, Roger, for reading with me. And um, thank you, all, anybody I forgot, thank you, too. So I'm going to be reading poems from Shore for the most part, and then a few newer pieces. And um, it's true that we are sort of in the aftermath of Hanukkah, and a lot of the poems in Shore do move from darkness to light, either shedding light on an idea or sort of beginning in a dark place but finding the hope within that place. I'm going to begin with the poem that begins the collection. It's called First Fruit. He wanted to know if the tomato, although it was pale orange and imperfect, was ripe enough to cut open, add to the asparagus and pears. And so he passed it to her, and when she opened her fingers to receive it and their hands lightly grazed, worlds collided. He could no longer see what was right in front of him. She squeezed the fruit from different angles, thought it was ready. When she gave it back to him, he studied its odd shape and said, it must have come from someone else's garden. And she said, yes, of course, as if she could be certain about anything anymore. This year, you sewed buttons on trousers and blouses, didn't climb Kilimanjaro or make poems, buttons on vests and sweaters. You didn't leave the country, take off your clothes on Table Mountain, buttons on slippers and slacks. I broke zippers with my teeth, climbed Masada, wrote out of fashion with my peers. My ankle turned to the east, I ran to the west, buttons fall from shorts and jackets, buttons the size of fruit, translucent as the moon, buttons hanging by threads. I asked for light. I asked for light in the missing tree, promised more light. I asked for the names of the dead in Pittsburgh, New Zealand, Chicago. Heard only numbers, 50 dead in Christchurch. Saw faces no longer innocent or alive. Without canopies of leaves, there is nothing between us and the sky, between us and strangers undressing behind shades across the way. I don't know the names of those shot down in a mosque, a synagogue, or the far corners of my city. Nothing shields us, and the wind howls syllables of lost names. What do we make of the hollowness in the center what can we plant as streets empty of American elms and shutters close against centuries of loss? I peel them open, rung by rung, reach for the hands of strangers kneeling across prayer rugs. Hope comes in small increments of light. So I don't know what kinds of conversations you remember from the pandemic years, but um, I was often involved in conversations along the lines of where would we go if we could go anywhere? We were all sort of trapped in our yards and houses at one point, and um, it's just sort of imagine like where would we go? So that this poem came out of there. If we could go anywhere. I take you back to the Arno, where Dante's lost papers rise to the surface of muddy river water, back to the way light absorbed the ordinary colors of day, how the last drop sparkled along the old bridge. I'd rest with you in the shadows of Tuscan poppies, too perfect to bring home, even in memory. 
I prefer the unruliness of mud sliding off the river bank, circling our ankles like bracelets, the sudden turns of street cats and motorbikes. History was everywhere. Sometimes we forgot to live in the present, to trust compasses would lead us to where we began. Maybe I take you to the unnamed rivers we passed on our way to the Jordan, buckets of red anemone, sheets hanging against winter rains turned to sleet through western windows. I'd follow you along trails of stone, cross over to the graves of martyrs and poets. I'd take you to what we didn't yet know, the flames of noontime rays, falling debris, boulders that tumbled down hills if we missed a step or followed a snake path. Maybe I'd bring you to the places of dreams, the shores of Essawaria, sun-soaked rooms, blue awnings to ward off disease. Or maybe I'd ask you to stay right here where our hands understand the shape of soil, the exact hour the sun lands on the porch each morning. Here where we sink in snow, no daffodils will emerge from their winter sleep as red-breasted birds return to the nest. So this next poem, I was just talking to Roger about pantoums, and um, this next poem is such a thing. It's a Malaysian form that's very popular in France, and it's a repetitive form where the second and fourth line of one stanza become the first and third of the next, and the first line becomes the last line of the poem, but slightly altered based on what happened in the poem. And this poem was an assignment. Whenever I'm given an assignment to write something for occasion, which is not very frequently, um, I have trouble getting started because I don't write that way. But um, this was an assignment for a, a congress of cantors, women, women cantors, and a male cantor was putting this to music. And um, at the same time, my daughter and her friends were becoming bat mitzvah, so I, it sort of um, speaks to that as well. It's called A Voice. In the beginning, a whimper, pounding of heart steps, whispers of open fists, prayer notes in stone, pounding of heart steps, chirps of morning songs, prayer notes in stone, the language of angels, chirps of morning songs, a girl stands at the threshold, Hears the language of angels, her own music breaking. A girl woman stands at the threshold, chants the first words of Torah, her own voice breaking into stones with burning names. When a woman chants the first words, she finds inside her own voice stones with burning names. A cry becomes a scream. She finds inside her own voice a silence a sigh, an exultation, a cry becomes a scream, a song of abundance. A silence, a sigh, an exultation, when a woman reaches the highest note in her abundant song, even the stones begin to tremble. Thank you. A new year. Say something true, she screamed into the future, even if it splays like waves, lands on my tongue. Land on my tongue, she screamed into the waves. Speak of autumn before the trees turn inward. As you turn inward toward autumn, she said, don't let me fall against the coming year. To the coming year, the distant waves, she said, take me with you, don't let me drown in your waters. To the distant waters, she cried, look at my footprints, let me run along your shores. To the turned ankle, the aching body, she said, don't let me fall inward. Say anything, she said to the open page, I don't believe in you, she said to the blank slate. I can see through you, she said to the white sheet, last year's words bleed through the first page of the book. Cast a shadow, she said to the old words, I know how to live without you. 
This next poem is also a pantoum because it was written for an occasion. It was for the installation of our rabbi at Beth Emmet, the Free Synagogue in Evanston, Illinois, Rabbi Andrea London, um, for her installation as senior rabbi. And it was also inspired by Jacob's encounter with an angel on rising. Rest your head on sacred stone, awaken to the faces of angels, wrestle your way to a new name, a house with veiled windows. Awaken to the faces of angels, whisper your way to abandoned air, a house with veiled windows, where sparrows land and ascend. Whisper your way to abandoned air, language rises, a mist of flying geese, sparrows land and ascend, take the names of angels. Language rises, a mist of flying geese, in the paths of mother birds who take the names of angels before they reappear. In the shadows of mother birds who fly beyond broken clouds before they reappear on ladders to open windows, who fly beyond broken clouds, land in a house of worship, on ladders to open windows between words and the unspoken. Land in a house of worship where we come face to face between words and the unspoken, rest our heads on sacred stone. So going back to miracles of Hanukkah and um, thinking, you can see many of these poems were written during the pandemic, or maybe you can't see that yet, but they, they were. And um, this poem was written sort of right as the miracle of vaccines was um, coming to be a reality. And it's also um, inspired by W.S. Merwin's poem, Thanks. It's called Waiting. Listen, with trees falling on houses, we are waiting for our roofs to be fixed. We are standing next to mailboxes, waiting for the dream to be delivered. We are scaling narrow bridges that lean into nameless rivers, waiting for our muddy boots to dry. With vaccines around the corner, we are reaching bare arms out frosted windows, waiting to touch a hand we used to touch all the time. We are waiting to skate to the center of the pond before the ice melts and splits in two like sinking countries. In the checkout line, we are waiting for the man in front of us to offer his place since he has only three things and we have so much more. We are waiting to understand that sometimes having less is really more for so many reasons, including there is less to lose if a fire catches onto the wooden porch and burns everything where we drink tea this year, even in December, waiting until it is really too cold to be together, waving so long to our summer friends, waiting outdoors, saying to the wind that takes everything, I dare you, waiting for the clouds to part so we can see Jupiter and Saturn aligned instead of waiting for the next time this will happen decades from now. We are waiting for food to return to the table, gifts that appear un unaccompanied at the door in the dark, waiting to say thank you for the cookies, the donuts, the tea, waiting for the next president to take office and save us, for the mailman to appear with the check, for the country to come together again like two halves of a shattered mirror. We are waiting near the frozen river, breaking tree branches into firewood, waiting for the flames that burn until everything is as pure as the snow that covers our homes, blankets us while we wait. I want to make clear that that was December 24th, 2020, when I was waiting for the next president to save us. It's important. Um, if it's not, I apologize, but I was just trying to put it into context. And finally, the last poem that I'm going to read from Shore, and then I'm going to read two new ones, um, is called Extreme Weather. And it begins with an epigraph by the poet Alberto Rios um, that reads, the border says stop to the wind, but the wind speaks another language and keeps going. They removed the fence that separates waves from people walking. 
There's nothing between us and water turning like oceans of larger coasts. The day we didn't dig my uncle's grave, a derecho swept the shores of Lake Michigan, uprooted ancient maples, American ash. We ran against the darkening sky, sheltered indoors and watched from a safe distance. His ashes danced the rhythms of distant waters. They call it erosion when waves take more than they give back, swallow the sand beneath our feet. If you walk away from the lake towards the shadows of hundred-year-old homes, you'll see ladders still leaning towards the roofs that failed when hail bombarded us in April, the night before the holiday of plagues. We tried to collect ourselves in the shards that landed in our gardens, hands still raw from March winds, we planted against tyranny and later gathered zucchini, tomatoes, and basil. There were seeds that promised to sprout but lay dormant. We watered throughout July's drought, nodded at neighbors through cloth masks and gloved knuckles. We kept turning the earth, planting milkweed next to dreams of an ordinary life. It's autumn and time to remove the tangled roots of what no longer bears fears. I had meant to write fruit, what no longer bears fruit, but fear accompanies every gesture. I'm writing to tell you that skies change suddenly, roots that seem deep can be lifted by November wind. Listen closely, nearby is the water we call life. And I apologize if anybody else was offended by my comment, but you can see I'm coming from a different territory where there's snow in December and we can't be outside during the pandemic, so anyway. Was that the issue? <laughs> no. <laughs> that was not the issue. Oh. I'm just saying a different context where I, I'm not used to offending people by I what I say. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, yes. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so. <clears throat> At least, yes, okay. Anyway, so I'm going to read a poem that is not, you know, post-Shore. It's from this anthology called New Voices, Contemporary Writers Confronting the Holocaust. And we were each given um, an archival photograph or document, and we were asked to kind of imagine the, you know, the life behind that document. And I was given a photograph of the painter... Shraga Weil and his wife Sarah, who were resistance fighters during World War II. And I did some research trying to find out a little bit about um, both of them, but I found nothing about Sarah, only a lot about Shraga. But I did discover that their daughter lives on a kibbutz outside of Tel Aviv, Kibbutz Ogen. I was able to interview her and meet her and see his paintings and even receive one of his paintings. And she filled me in a little bit about her mother, but um, there still wasn't that much compared to the information about Shraga. So I ended up writing this poem through Sarah. It's a persona poem so that um, I could kind of connect with her in that way. And in this poem, she's writing to her husband Shraga at the end of his life. We built a house. We built a house out of everywhere because nowhere was safe except the place our eyes met, even as yours looked west to Budapest and mine gazed east toward the dream. We lived in the places our fingers joined. Your other hand forged documents so Yudin could move invisibly through cities. My left hand sewed lead from your pencils into the hems of our coats just in case. We built a house out of just in case. We ran with blueprints in our mittens back and forth to Slovakia until we were caught. They thought they could keep us apart in the Hungarian prison, but we still had the insides of your pencils. I will never forget the words we wrote, one at a time on scraps of paper, the words we rolled into balls and left on courtyard sills. When they took us on separate strolls, I saw your face in the distance as you unrolled my gift. The smile that only I understood bloomed in the house we built of secrets. Alone, I imagined your hands, the lives you saved with your signature. 
When I heard stories of the others with yellow stars, my nights were the color of ash. We believed the sea would free us as we sailed toward Palestine. We built a house of water and our ship of orphans. When we were captured again in Cyprus, your canvas held the blue of the Mediterranean. For nine months, you built structures with the children out of wooden blocks. When we reached the shores of Tel Aviv, a tent was already pitched for us on kibbutz. Our visions mingled with the soil that kept us. Our hands, sticky from orange groves, were always entwined. You called me your muse and sketched faces of Chalutzim, the miracle of daily life, the way you once drew the faces of evil. You made Hebrew signs and painted pomegranates, phoenixes, and rams. They built you a straw hut for your paintings, laughing, we called it the Louvre. When you look back, farther back than Europe, you painted Jacob, Joseph, and Abraham, who sacrificed his son. I don't know when the colors in Joseph's coat became black and white stripes. The haunted face of the prisoner sits on the edge of your canvas. We built a house with our hands, our words, and our silence. We built a house of forgetting. And I'm going to end with just a very short poem that was written recently, but not too recently, in, um, when there were a lot of fires and floods back in July. It's called Petition. These are the long weeks of waiting for the air to clear from distant fires. Birds of paradise wake us from dreams of burning worlds. Let the disappearing rivers fill to meet us where we sit. Pray as rising waters swallow houses built on borrowed land. Let us remember the boy pounding pavement with the ball he later throws through hoops. Let him catch and return it to its place. Let us all return to the place we can feel at home or just feel again the sadness of soil. Let the sadness bloom into forgiveness. Let us forgive the tall grasses for smothering the lilies, the green tomatoes that turn towards the sun. Let them become orange before we leave. Let us gather the ripened strawberries before the dogs devour them and we grieve. Let the trees hold rain long after. Thank you. Thank you. So while, um, while Roger gets himself set up, please could I ask for our help in getting the tables clear and getting the stuff all the way over there. It'll be immensely helpful to our team if we do that. Testing one, two, three. All right, we're safe. You tell me when you want to. Right. I will follow. I, I, I follow all instructions. What's that, darling? Sit with your husband. Whatever you want. To do. It's fine. That was great, by the way. That was enjoyed it. You know.
to sit down once we're clear. <laughs> Please come on back and sit down. Thank you. So if you'll take a seat once more. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks for hanging out. And uh, thanks to Dina for inviting me to read with her. I really enjoyed being in Tuscany with you. <laughs> All those big buttons. <laughs> Huge buttons. <laughs> that was cool. Um, so, uh, this book, The Missing Jew, it, the first version came out in 1979 when I was 29, and the latest version came out last year. So it's, it's about 46 years worth of um, poems. And I want to start with a poem that I wrote long ago. It's called Pilpul, and it's based on a real quote from Talmud, the first line, or the second line, and uh, I think it's in Menachot. And a Pilpul is a sort of Talmudic puzzler Sometimes the students, I think, were a little rascally and they would pose certain kinds of questions to get the rabbi's blood uh, moving a bit. And this is an example. Okay, so it's called Pilpul. Rabbi, if a child is born with two heads, which head should wear the yarmulke? <laughs> On which head the tefillin? Some say the right head. Some say the left. All quote Torah. Some say both heads, just in case. But if a man is born with two heads, he's always confused. He never knows on which head to wear the yarmulke. Two heads and only two eyes. He walks towards himself in the old cemetery where the rabbis are buried. There seems to be some disagreement. Some are saying, we are dead. Others, we are alive. Some say both, all quote Torah. <laughs> so, um, so I'm gonna uh, zoom ahead to a more recent poem uh, since we just had a lovely meal. Um, it's, it's a poem dedicated to that most Jewish of all foods, gefilte fish. Um, I guess you could call it an ode to gefilte fish. I didn't call it that, but um, um, there is a kind of reference here to uh, Greek mythology, but I think as Jews, we can stand up to every culture and have something to say and have something to say back to us. That's, that's the world I want to live in. Okay, gefilte. Colorless, odorless, tasteless, gefilte fish. Your hooves of brown jelly and ceremonial carrot tremble as if deciding between being and non-being. In the periodic table, you would be a xenon. I am here, says gefilte fish, and I'm not going anywhere. Take me as I am. Eat me to join a secret club. How I long for your unappetizing gray. Fumit goo melting around your waist. 
your jaunty orange cap sliding askew. A bold dab of horseradish gives you flavor you never earned. Boiled ball of fish flesh and matzo meal, bland, suckering the bland. The bubbling stew you emerged from was a witch's cauldron of fish heads. Their dead eyes whirling wildly, you dripped like a zoftig Venus. Or are you one of the castrated balls of time? Or the chilled brain of a zombie? My fork divides you, my mouth waters. I crave your permanent humility, your humble inadequacy. You accept you will never be beautiful, which is beautiful. Like me, you can only be yourself. Eating you is almost a cannibalism. How soft you are like baby's food, mother pre-chewed. One taste, and I am me. So, so I want to read, um, we're in the, um, I had a teacher once to talk to about, she had things on Saturday nights, her name was Colette, and she spoke of the perfume of the Shabbat. So we're in the perfume of Hanukkah. And uh, this, this um, poem is called Homeless Hanukkah. Um, I think that every city has this issue. I live in New Orleans and we have homeless folks on the streets and I've read that you guys do too, although I haven't seen them yet, um, but I heard tell. So this poem is called Homeless Hanukkah. He's wearing an old scholar's robe, but his head is stuffed with straw. In the village of idiots, he is king of fleas. His teeth, rotten corn, his hands, torn rags. The rabbi of thunder blesses him with a crooked stick of fire. He kneels in the mud and cow flop. As the rain whips him, he shivers and stinks. The skies are ruined purple, the moon a blackened eye. He thinks again, why do I have a name? Let the thunder answer or the moon winking in the sky. The old month is dying and the new one is born in the dark. He'll light a candle for courage and watch the tip of light twist through the braided wax. He'll light a candle and set it in the mud where it is most needed. He'll light a candle for the dumb cow. When the moon has buried itself behind the hill, he will sleep in a blanket of frost, an unlit candle, a crumpled shamus. Uh, thanks. So um, this is this is my other Hanukkah poem. It's called Rededication or the Do Over. I was explaining Hanukkah the other night to a friend of mine who's adopted a five-year-old and. I came across that word, uh, dedication, you know, trying to explain. And I said, well, we could just call it do-over. Happy do-over, right? Because that's what Hanukkah means, do-over. Okay, so rededication. They took over my temple and filled it with idols. I saw myself bowing down to dim grotesques, to angry trolls. I got lost in a hall of mirrors and worshiped each angle of my faces till the light dimmed with estrangement and I slipped into a pool of murk. I slept in the temple, I grew old. The priests were numbness and indifference. No one ever came to worship there but me. One night, a man with a hammer came and smashed all the mirrors. The light flooded my eyes. Who would I worship now that there was nothing and I was nothing? 
And then I heard a new song sing itself in me. The men with hammers filled the halls and built. The doors flung open and crowds surged in, cousins, brothers, and sisters. I grabbed a broom and swept the dust of cracked idols. When night fell again, we lit a candle that burned for a week and a day. Thank you. Um, so since we're talking about broken things, I'll read this uh, little poem called The Broken Tablets. It's in a different book called The, the Lowercase Jew, The Missing Jew, The Jew Brilliant Marketing, right? I'm going to get the huge audience. All the Jews who love poetry. It's like a Venn diagram. You know? <laughs> All the Jews, all the ones who love poets, it's like this little sliver, but what a group. It's a great group, and I hope you join it. <laughs> okay. So, um, the broken tablets. This also has a, a quote from Talmud. Um, Rabbi Joseph learnt both the tablets and the fragments of the tablets were deposited in the ark. You know, I started writing The Missing Jew partly because I was given a copy. I grew up in a reform synagogue um, where God wasn't mentioned and too much. Um, but um, we were good people, and um, we meant well. But I never had seen the Talmud until I was uh, in my 20s, and the rabbi died, and I inherited the one from the library. So. I started reading it and it sounded just like my grandfather who had also died that year. So that was kind of what got me started really. That sort of visceral sense of voice through all those millennia. Okay. The broken tablets were also carried in an ark insofar as they represented everything shattered, everything lost. They were the law of broken things the leaf torn from the stem in a storm, a cheek touched in fondness once, but now the name forgotten. How they must have rumbled, clattered on the way, even carried so carefully through the wasteland, how they must have rattled around until the pieces broke into pieces, the edges softened, crumbling, Dust collected at the bottom of the ark, ghosts of old letters, old laws. Insofar as a law broken is still remembered, these laws were obeyed. And insofar as memory preserves the pattern of broken things, these bits of stone were preserved through many journeys and ruined days. Even they say, into the promised land. Um, thank you. I'm going to um, read another poem from this book. I, I feel I need to. Um, it's called Grandfather Claus. It's uh, the grandfather of David Kamenetz, um, who died in 1974, just before I began writing these, po uh, writing these poems. Okay. Um, some of what I say in this poem, I later found out wasn't true. <laughs> I'm a poet, I'm not an historian, what can I say? Okay, so, but a lot of it is true. <laughs> if only you'd done what you'd been told to do, if only you'd not been lifted by a chance wind west above the wheat tips of, the U of Ukraine, the thunder of nouts, the Cossacks shouting. If you had stayed instead to be murdered, the Einsatzgruppen, old men like you, fingers palsied on the trigger, bellies shaking at the recoil, would have shot you dead at the edge of a pit 
slaughtered you on the outskirts of a town Jews could not enter after sundown. There is a clause that refers to you in the inner lining of a foreign language where Jew is the dirtiest word ever. This clause prepared in advance of your name is the secret history of your death, decreed in a grammar strange to your Yiddish, as the language I speak is still inflected by the death that might have been. Yet you entered America like a pilgrim or a germ, which was it, or both, as America decided, with your Jewish heart and lungs and your Jewish disease and two strong fingers and a needle. Why should I tell that old story again? I'm still immigrating into this moment, learning that the words applied to you apply to me. Even after all this time, I will not allow anyone to annihilate your name and mine. I am grandfathered in. So, so um, I, I knew I was reading in a synagogue, but I, I, in my fantasy, I didn't realize it would look like this. But anyways, <laughs> but I, I, I want to say something about that, because I often have felt that people spend so much money building buildings for synagogues that are, have no soul, and you guys built from the soul first. And I think that is so important. So uh, I don't know if you're building one now, but anyway, that's a good place to begin. So, and I like, I, I feel like I'm winning. So I think I won something. You know? <laughs> kind of, all right, so this poem, it's called My Daughter's Bat Mitzvah. My daughter's uh, way past Bat Mitzvah age now. Okay. As my daughter, still a girl, in her white talis, received the Torah from my hands, passed to me from my father, I thought, it is so very heavy, and your shoulders are so slim. I thought, Run, run out of here as fast as you can. Down the center aisle, past the readers, out the double doors into the sun. Don't think twice, keep running until shadows of the day release you into the dark of night. Cold birds still in the oaks, no songs, only stars, where you will be free. But it was too late for the dark to obscure our woe. Already you were holding our book in your arms. Already your life and mine were bound in the same scroll with the repeating names of ancestors, Abraham and Sarah, Moses and Miriam, and laws and songs and spaces between the words where emptiness still breathes. For the sake of that emptiness and the sound of its breath, the secret name you might hear there someday, I blessed you with this heavy gift. Um, I don't want to hold you guys too late. Uh, hold us. Okay, I'll, I'll hold you. Okay, thank you. Um, if you gotta go, you gotta go. Okay, <laughs> that's right. Um, so um, I think I'll read a poem um, for um, my teacher, Rabbi Zalman Schachter Shalomi, who I met in the JFK airport, leaning against a stanchion with a beret. He was a, younger than I am now, and he was um, translating the Buddhist text, the Dhammapada, into Hebrew. I said, wow, Rabbi, where have you been all my life? <laughs> okay. Right. 
but uh, he was Anne's teacher as well, so um, maybe some of you knew him as well. And the poem is called Dumia, Angel of Silence, for Reb Zalman Zikron Bracha, who first spoke to me of Dumia, and some of the teachings came from here, but of course, I fooled around with them, so don't blame Reb Zalman. When I was in the womb, learning the Torah of the womb, Torah of threads of light, verses of the building bone, cell by cell, blood streamed, nerve by nerve, the angel taught me the Torah of night and day. I had no understanding, no tongue. The angel was patient as silence. Is there a Sabbath in the womb? There is not even a year. But the angel, she and he, male and female, created me it. I had no breath. The angel taught me vowels. My lungs slept quiet as flatfish at sea bottom. Eyes stirred in unbuilt lids. In the other womb of the dream, I slept and woke, sleeping and waking, waking in sleep. I lived and loved 40 years and 40 days in the telling. My heart broke, healed and broke again in the desert, the mountain on the verge of a promised land. Then the world was created, begun before beginning. She and he created he them and the angel created me, me. The flood came and I rushed and never knew the Torah of three months untaught me, which I would learn the Avram of Abraham the Sarai of Sarah, Torah of three months untaught that I must learn in actual breath. And as I cried with first air and inhuman light and the presence of the dead, my mother lying in the blood and scream of the actual hour, the angel pressed his finger to my lip and left her fingerprint there and drove all Torah from my brain and left me baffled, cold, and still. First erasure, blankness, dumb, I rushed into the unwritten world. Oh. Hey, are we running out of time? Okay, how much time do we have? Very little. <laughs> Can I read one more? Oh, okay. They might ask for what? Just one poem. Okay. Which one do you want? <laughs> okay. All right, good. I'm going to read one more. I understand. We have to go to sleep. Um, well, there's a poem I really wanted to read to you, so I'm going to read it. And um, then we can enjoy. It's called The Circulation of the Mourners. And... The setting is the Temple Mount seen from the Valley of Hinnom. And there's a quote from Jeremiah who said, And they have built the shrines of Topheth in the Valley of Ben-Hinnom to burn their sons and daughters in fire, which I never commanded, which never came to my mind. Actually, how can you read any more after Jeremiah? But there you go. Okay. So you have the setting. How many have been to Jerusalem? Like how many have been to Ben the Valley Gehenna, the Valley of Ben Hinnom? Yes, around the old city. Okay, good. So they worship Moloch there and they burn children to Moloch. But that's that's really all I have to tell you. But anyway, I'll read the poem. The old god walked in the crevice in a narrow valley of smoke and fire, while the new god hovered between the tips of wings. Mourners circled the outer wall of the new God who lived in a secret house within a house of prayer, though no one spoke his name. The mourners circled clockwise, non-mourners counterclockwise, or was it the other way around? Written in the book either way, while the old God walked with eyes on the ground. 
How down to earth is our old God, his worshippers sang. How practical and implacable, never lifts his eyes, even to the face of the child we burned. This is how a God should be, though some said he searches for something lost in the ground. Then let us bring him gold along with the child, and the old God seemed pleased while the new god waited for animal blood to splash against his clean white walls. The mourners circled slowly counterclockwise while sweet smoke of the old god rose from the narrow valley to mingle with smoke of the new. When I saw a mourner circling opposite, I knew just how to greet her. But we were all mourners in the valley, all blind in confusion in the smoke. When the temple broke its walls and priests spilled into the soldiers' spears, they say the new god rose straight into the sky, leaving the cherubs' wings bare, cherubs we made of fire and gold. Now the old god lives in the house among cracked basins and broken columns a haunter of ruins, while the new god mourns in the valley of broken children. Bits of white stone have tumbled into the valley of smoke and fire, where bits of white bone are buried. It is all written in the book. Someday I hope to read to my child. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Dina. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Shabbat shalom, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>